everyone and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. This is James Cork and with me I have Norman Sanso. Hello, hello guys. And awesome and irreverent internet reviewer, Silver Whale. I have been called the Anti-Celestia, but I am not Anti-Celestia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. Is that is that like the newest bad movie from... Uh, uh, the guy who did Antichrist. <laughs> oh, God. No. What's the name of that guy? Last von Trier. That's right. Is that the new Last von Trier movie, Anti Celestia? Yeah. <laughs> that would make millions. <laughs> <laughs> I'd agree. That will make a, a, a bad lot of money. And uh, if we can keep ourselves focused this time, which I have right. a chance, we are reviewing the My Little Pony micro issue number eight. That is the one focused on Princess Celestia, written by Georgia Ball and with art by Amy Meverson. So, wow, this one. I don't know, should I start doing the synopsis for this one? Because as simple as it is, it actually has quite a lot of implications in it. Well, do the synopsis, man. People want to know. Well, there is a celebration at Canterlot Castle, of course, and there is a lot of high society ponies coming in with their, um, their children. Or, of course, uh, it's, it's a celebration for the... Uh, the end of the school year in Celestia's uh, uh, school for gifted students, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one, yeah. And they are uh, organizing the celebration and everything, but during such celebration, one of the teachers, uh, uh, one of the sp and one spell seems to go wrong or something, and the food in the in the food court starts becoming alive. And one of the teachers tries to solve the situation, but she ends up making the things uh, the situation even worse. Which leads to the parents complaining and wanting to kick the teacher out of the school. Now, Celestia has to intervene to prevent this from happening. Would you say that's a fair assessment of the comic, or did I leave something in the something behind? Well, you left a few bits, but those are really spoilery. So... We can go back. In, yeah, we can like always. If there is um, if you want to keep reading, if you want to keep. Uh, listening to us talking about the comic, just go ahead because uh, from from now on there is a spoilers. So you want to read the comic before listening to us. So stop, go read the comic, and come back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if but you have also, read the comic, please go ahead. But it also highlights how the synopsis for uh, this comic, which yours was very accurate, kind of belies the meaning in it. It's like when you try and summarize a two-hour movie in three sentences or less. <laughs> Go watch it. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much the point, is that if we start talking about what the comic, uh, what's happening in the comic and the stuff that's going on in it, we are pretty much going to tell you the, the entire story. So mm -hmm. let's just give a skinny of it and then uh, allow the people to discover the comic by themselves. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. uh, this comic, among many others, it is uh, worth sitting down, opening its pages and uh, discovering it. Yep, yep. Because it will give you, a, it will give you an insight on um, on Princess Celestia that we haven't had from the actual show. Oh, yeah. I mean, the reflection arc was one thing, but this one is another. And uh, when I first started reading the My Little Pony comics, there's always been one thing in my mind, especially from the micro-series, is that each issue has a moral to the story because in the first one, you have Twilight, and the moral for the story is make a friend and be a friend to others. And it carries on and so on and so on. And with this one, this one is really deep. And ay, 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 it made me tear up just because of the story itself and how awesome it is. Oh, boy. Like, oh, just, mm, it's so good. It's so good. But, oh, sorry for hogging the mic. Um, Who else wants to take a step at this? I'm, I'm, going, to give, I'm going to give the stage to Silver, really. Norman, I, I'd like to hear you fangasm some more. Mm-hmm, that's good comic. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, dude. It's like he's enjoying a fine wine. It, it yeah. is. I mean, I have, I, well, I'm not even touching on the, um, the what you call the this? The details. Yeah, the little details, the reference, the thing that they do in here. I mean, we got Gordon Ramsay's pony in here. Like, <laughs> Gordon Ramsay's pony. Like, oh my goodness. And and Gordon Ramsay noticed it, by the way. I, I know. And he we, tweeted about it. I know. 
We also got Huey, Dewey, and Louie from the DuckTales or Donald Duck, whatever it is. Yeah, we also yeah, got DuckTales. Harry Potter. In here. I mean, there's a lot of things yeah, to touch upon. There is, so, there is also Severus Pony as well. Mm-hmm. Severus Snape Pony. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, like, all those are nice. But what really got my attention was the moral of the story. That's it. Like, what sold me on this was the moral. When this comic came out, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember if this came out during season two or three. I think three. But it, so, was co- it, it came September out between seasons 20, 000, three and four. Yeah, it was in yeah, September it, 2013. Yeah, okay. every, uh, just so you get um, uh, an idea of when all the comics were coming out, the first comic was coming out when uh, the third season was uh, in full swing. And I am talking issue one, of the regular series, the one with Queen Chrysalis. That mm-hmm. was the first issue that was coming out. And the, uh, the the micros didn't start coming out until the end of season three. After that, that summer of 2013 was awesome because every month we had two comics to follow. One of, one of the micros and one of the main series. And it was great. But for three seasons, one thing I've been saying is Oh, I really hope we get to learn more about Celestia. I'd like to know more about Celestia. Hey, is Celestia going to do anything other than give exposition? No? Okay. I mean, of all the characters in the show, she's the one I feel like we know the least about and I'm the most curious to learn. A thousand years of experience. You'd think there'd be some stories to tell. And it's strange that um, a lot of fans make the argument, well, she's had a thousand years to live. Her story's basically done. I don't agree with that. Your life, your story is done when your life is done, and she's nowhere near done. So to get to see her in action, I mean, in just the first three pages, we get to see several things that we never see in the show. She's interacting with her own subjects without Twilight. She gets to show some frustration at ponies, even if it's just a a little semi-glare at Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Mm-hmm. and seeing her take the lead in a situation and and teaching other ponies. That is so much more well-rounded than her presentation in the show, where she's basically there for Twilight. She is Twilight's teacher. She is Twilight's uh, mentor. She's Twilight's assignment giver. Very rarely is she truly a leader in Equestria. So I, I was thrilled just to see that. And then to get the story, the characterization, uh, the relationship she has with these other ponies, it was, uh, it made this my third favorite of the micro series and one of my favorite comics of the whole franchise. There is one video game called Lost Odyssey. Oh, uh, exclusive for the Xbox 360, done by the guy who created Final Fantasy. It's a comic. It's a comic. It's a video game about four characters that have lived for like a thousand years. And one of the gameplay mechanics on that game is that uh, you will come across uh, regular events, daylight events, uh, day life events of other characters, and the main character will have a flashback to something that happened in his life. This comic reminded me of that. It's it's looking into not the not only the big events because there is a big event going on in flashback format, which is when Celestia met uh, uh, this one character whose name I completely Inkwell. Inkwell. Okay, Inkwell. Yes, uh, where Celestia met up with this Inkwell uh, character and where where their friendship was forged. But it's it's looking at something outside of the Nightmare Moon banishing and the Discord petrifying and the Crystal Empire banishing and all that and like it's it's moving all of that aside there is so much that you can squeeze out of a thousand years worth of history that we don't have in the show but the comics allow you to do that and it's it's like it it it's funny how heavy it feels at times because celestia is dealing with something that is really important to her but it's also very light because it's such a tiny a little event that any other character wouldn't give too much importance to it, but because it's Celestia, the most benign, good-hearted, kind character in the show, that she has the patience of a saint because she has to deal with 
not just her students, but all these other problems. And she has the time to take care of this one character and, and defend her and change people's perspectives and the way that they are seeing her. Uh, that was great. The characterization of Celeste is probably one of my favorites because she is such she is such a good-hearted character, which is also another type of character that I adore. I love characters that are lawful good. <laughs> I like characters that 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 defend uh, uh, that defend the good. I like heroes uh, the same way that I like anti-heroes. I like heroes, so I do, I do love Celestia's characterization in this. I don't like the characterization of almost everyone else, though. Celestia and Ingwell, Ingwell, great, but Floribunda can go die in a bonfire. Okay, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> she reminds me of. A, a friend of the family that we used to have who was exactly like her wow. and she had a daughter exactly like her not that not that she was special i like trains and <laughs> turtles but more like oh i am so pretty i am the prettiest and she was as ugly as a speed in the face it was oh, so Ooh. she yeah reminded me of something of my personal life that i rather forget that is not good <laughs> i am sorry i'm prejudiced when it comes to that character because i hate that kind of people and i love how inkwell basically uh verbally verbally smacks down her when she's telling her to uh to change that toad into something prettier and inkwell is uh, is all like ah oh, this big bo- this big boy doesn't need changing he's perfect the way he is and even though they explain Floribunda's character, it's not enough. <laughs> that is like two panels worth of, oh, I was assaulted and bullied in school, so now I have to assault and bully other people. <laughs> it it uh... makes sense, because that's almost always bully behavior. We we will saw that in the Babsy episode, mm-hmm. to put an example with this, uh, this show and the comic. But... Guys, it's not enough. This character is an absolute pain in the ass for the entire comic. You cannot just take one page and make me feel sorry for her. It's impossible. So she, she almost ruins the comic for me. Almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not an issue big enough for me to condone the comic. I really enjoyed it. And just to put another perspective into account, my sister, uh, she hated Celestia after mm-hmm. the end of season two. When that Canterlot wedding episode where Celestia oh, just smacked down Twilight and all that, my sister was like, oh, you... That's not a word. So oh after that, and, and throughout all of season three and throughout all of season four, she didn't like Celestia. And then she read the comic, <laughs> this comic, and then my sister is like, I didn't understood. I didn't know. I am so sorry. Oh, my God. I feel terrible. That's my sister speaking. Oh, and I, for- it's... It was great, and I'm like, that's that's that goes to show how good the characterization of Celestia is in this comic. Is that it can change somebody's uh, mind to see how they were judging the character wrongly after the end of of the second season. Mm-hmm. Well, that ties in with the representation that in the show Celestia really is limited to Twilight. The story is told from Twilight's perspective, therefore. I'll receive Celestia's Twilight. I need you to go do this, that, and the other thing. This comic makes Celestia part of the world. She's genuinely interacting with it, and she surprisingly has a greater focus on honoring the people she's known. And that's clear from the very start of the comic, which is part of why I actually love most of the characters in this comic. Yeah, the uh, the the basically the school board lady. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what did you say in her? Flora? Floribunda. Floribunda. I know it's wow. it's a very Spanish the, name, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm afraid it doesn't roll off the tongue for me. <laughs> Floribunda. But, oh, but getting but getting ready for this uh, tea ceremony or tea party, I guess. Which man, that does not sound badass. <laughs> uh, you've got three teachers. You've got Giddily, unicorn teacher, first year. She is just bouncing. She's kind of the unicorn Pinkie Pie. Mm-hmm. So we've got Giddily, Surprise, and Pinkie Pie, the, tri- the triumvirate. Uh, then you've got Ginger Snap, who is a more veteran uh, teacher, and she- some of the enthusiasm has left her. She's more snarky. She's more bored with the ceremony. The spark is starting to dwindle. Mm-hmm. And that's the, pa- that's the phase in life where you start to question if you really want to stick around and keep doing this. 
And then you have Inkwell, the most senior, the one who's seen it all, who's experienced it, she's witnessed changes, she's had progression. And then there's Celestia, who has seen Inkwell go through all three stages, newcomer, veteran, senior. And you realize just by reading this comic that Celestia has seen that for so many ponies. And to borrow a little bit from Doctor Who, in some way that perspective makes her realize just how important it is to remember everyone. This isn't even a struggle to keep uh, Inkwell on the staff. You're right that it's a minor thing if she were to lose her job. Celestia would make sure she landed on her hooves. No mm -hmm. threat there. But it's the real struggle is to get the ponies to remember and honor everything Inkwell did, including being the first to stand against Celestia in an onslaught and coming away with a battle wound. In fact, it, I think she's the first pony I saw with real, a physical Scar. Injur injury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because... Yeah, that is true. No, he's right. He's right. And it's like, wow, that battle had consequence. It had a lasting impact. It's not, <laughs> well, you say Canada at Wedding. Remember after the love spell went off and all the changelings get banished? Yeah. There's one pony in the background. He was being threatened by a changeling less than two seconds ago, but he's trotting <laughs> off like it ain't no thing. And I'm just like, wow, you guys have the shortest memory. <laughs> Mm. And here is a struggle to honor your elders, remember everything they've done. And even if maybe Inkwell's becoming a little more quirky as the filters come down, mm -hmm. that's no reason to think less of her. I think it's still, I think you're still justified in uh, expressing frustration or confusion at some of the more awkward moments, but never to think less of her. True. I mean, this is a lesson where it's relevant in this day and age because I'm not sure about you guys, but for me, we always have this saying that um, respect your elders and whatnot. And that's been embedded in the Asian mindset where you need to respect your elders no matter who or what they are. And you just respect them because they're more senior than you, they live longer than you, and they have more experience than you. And while reading this, I felt happy and the whole moral, like I like always say, this, the moral of this book, it's really awesome. It's like, how do I put this? Throughout all the micros, like in the Pinkie Pie one, it's about um, discovering your self-worth, like what can you do because you enjoy doing this but you can't do this anymore. I will shift my focus to another thing that's similar to this. Yay! So with this one, it's like respecting your elders because they did a lot for you when you were younger, especially that Flora Boon... Flora person. person. Floribunda. Yeah, Floribunda. I'm happy, really I'm, I'm happy really that I am the only one. I'm very happy that I'm the only person. Only person who knows how to pronounce that name because I swear to God that is such a Spanish name. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> yeah, but anywho, it's all about this because looking at that and looking at how they were. I mean, it's all about the feels with me on this one. I really appreciate this one. I, I can't say much because the more I think about it, it's. I'm going to repeat myself because this is what I enjoy more, not the cameos, not the references, not even the convoluted timeline in this one. Like, when did this happen? When blah, blah, blah. How did this happen? Blah, blah, blah. I'm not even going to go into that. The moral of the story where Celestia goes in here, asks for help from a friend, and said friend does help Celestia and goes through everything from starting the school till where she is now, an old pony where people seem to not understand her method of teaching. Well, eh, I just enjoy this one so much. I, um, I wouldn't call this my favorite of the micros. I wouldn't call it my least favorite of the micros. Mm -hmm. um, but there is one thing that keeps nagging at me, and I think this is where the comic kind of falls flat. But then again, it's also like it. it it's. It, it, uh, 
I always criticize people who say, but I don't like this because it doesn't go the way I want to. Oh, I don't want this because it's not what I thought it was going to be. Oh, I don't like this because it's not like my fan fiction. Oh, my. Uh, and and I am like, God, I hate these people. I don't understand them. Now, to talk about this comic, I wish it could have gone a different way at the end. <laughs> I am a hypocrite when it comes to this, but it really kind of knocks me that in a perfect world where uh, My Little Pony would allow to do something very risky, uh-huh. when Celestia goes to visit Inkwell at the end of the I comic... I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> in a perfect world... Ingwell would be dead. <laughs> I know! I know! Ingwell wouldn't be sleeping. It's a kid's comic. Fine. That's fine. That's okay. And they have dealt with a very heavy issue, and they are limited to a number of pages and to a number of themes. <laughs> if the show hasn't touched upon the subject of death, I don't think the comics are going to touch upon the subject of death in a serious, heavy manner. I don't think so they will. It's, it's, it, I, un- I understand it. It's understandable. However, it could have been so much better if after this story, they kill off Inkwell. That, that would have made me cry. I know. This ending doesn't make me cry, though. Well, it makes me feel like they are jerking me around. That's what I feel like. Personal opinion, personal experience. I know, I know. It's I, not the fault of the comic. Mm. It's just me unable to enjoy this ending. True. Everything else is no problem, but... You know... Ah, you it, know it, 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 lacks the, it, it lacks that oomph. But you know, James, I, I, can, I agree with you there. Because just my mindset for this comic, how it should have ended, is after the whole meeting's done, Inkwell goes to her office, she sleeps on the table, Celestia goes to Inkwell cover her with a blanket, and notice something's wrong. Check on her, she's passed on. Yeah, she reached her, she reach her deadline, she reached her expiry date, whatever you want to call it. And end it there. We would be bawling our eyes out. You two are really nice. dark. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, says the guy who started the review trying to execute Flash Sense. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hey, that was a public service. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't mess with my husband, though. What are, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I, learned, I learned something new about you today. Why? He really, isn't my, he, he, he really isn't my husband, though. He's hoity-toity. Anyway, <laughs> um, anyway. And, and but, I'm not joking actually, on that either. But <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. But you, you, you've you given me an opening to a tweet by, uh, I believe it was Georgia Ball. Oh, the writer of uh, The Hit Raider. She made the comment that the final panel really is supposed to represent the friendship between a being that will live, well, seemingly immortal, and a pony who is not. That maybe they weren't overtly saying uh, that she, Inkwell, had passed away, but that it's implied that one day, most likely sooner than later, they're going to have to say goodbye. And that ties into the theme I saw throughout this entire comic, the Celestia's immortality. When, when I got into this fandom, everything about Celestia seemed to call back to uh, David Tennant's Doctor Who. Oh, living forever is a tragedy. Oh, I've, I'm so sad that everyone keeps dying around me. Oh, immortality is a curse, and so on. And it's like, geez, guys, you know, there's some good that comes out of it, too. And that's what I saw in this comic. We start with Celestia nurturing uh, young foals, including special snowflakes. <laughs> then so we jump geez. back in time to her not only defending Canterlot from an invasion by shadowy forces, which <laughs> I think we all kind of pictured at some point she'd be doing that over the centuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go on a tangent later. but <laughs> um, But we got to see that from that she realizes the need to have more defenders thanks to Inkwell's uh, courage. And so she find, she creates the, the school for gifted unicorns. Hey, that's something. And even at the end, when she's talking with Flora Blunga Ding Dong, <laughs> uh, she is helping them not only remember what they've learned, but also kind of securing the future for the next generation. Everything about this is Celestia's impact on Equestria's growth, again, she has a role in it. And yeah, I, I realize I'm, I think this is the third time I'm getting into this, but 
it it makes such an impact to say that she has an influence on this world, that it's more than just, I have a mission for Twilight. I, I really hate to sound like I, I am being anti-Celestia because I really enjoy her character and I want to see it represented well. And I feel like this uh, the show's treatment where it's kind of get her out of the way as quickly as possible, I, I get it gets frustrating after a while. And that's why I love this comic more. It's everything I'd love to see in the show, just in comic form. Mm. Well, well, then again, it's impossible for you not to get that from this comic because it's a micro. The micros are supposed to focus... Uh, more prominently in one character. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, you're going to get in this comic what you wouldn't get in the show. Now, uh, hopefully, there is enough good feedback from the comics that they see, hey, look at that. People actually want to know more about these characters. Maybe we can have an episode focused entirely on the background characters. Mm, that will be brilliant. Well, that will be something that we want to, that we want to see. Funny, <laughs> that you, funny yeah, that you, that's, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I was walking into that intentionally. Yeah. So well, funny I that really you mentioned that, that, James. Uh, I recently interviewed Heather Breckel, the colorist for the IDW official My Little Pony comics, and I asked her this question: How long do you think that IDW will keep doing the f um, Friends Forever series? Because with... as long as people keep buying it, mm -hmm. dude, yeah, yeah, it's I mean, all a marketing thing. If they don't buy it. They are not going to keep yeah, making it. True. I mean, but here's the thing. Um, when I asked her, like, if with the micro series, it ended on episode, it ended on issue ten with uh, Luna being the last, and with the Friends Forever series, um, she got no we're idea. We're on twelve. We're on twelve now, right? Yeah. Like the last, the, the, the last one that got announced was mm -hmm. issue number twelve. Yeah. And she said she got no idea. As long as people are buying it, uh, they'll keep making it, and they'll add in combos all over the place like the recent one that they announced is rarity and bab seed yeah that is a strange combo it's you know it's a perfect combo because it's best pony and best pony is best pony and she's everything that she's in is the best and uh <laughs> shut up you're wrong if you disagree with me and if you don't have my opinion <laughs> yeah but Run still path. yeah but still um <laughs> the, the point of the matter is the point of the matter is um, as long as we keep supporting the comic, we'll get more comics from IDW. And who knows, in the future, maybe we'll get our dream combo of Celestia and Luna in a comic. Who knows, one day, right? I seriously well, want to see an episode. Just an episode. 22 minutes. The uh, That Celestia and Luna interacting together and that's it. Oh, yeah. Please! I, I, it's <laughs> not, I'm pretty sure it, it, uh, it doesn't have to be that difficult. We 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 managed to squeeze slice of life out of everything in this show. Mm. I'm pretty sure they can squeeze some slice of life between Celestia and Luna. Probably. I, don't, I at this point I really don't know what's holding them back. Mm. I don't know. The fact that uh, pretty princesses lines princesses <laughs> aren't supposed to have issues. This is I'm going to be harping on this in a video so I don't want to spoil it. Hurt hurt you guys, mm -hmm. but Here's the thing. You guys ever heard of a of a psychologist named Carl Jung? No. I have heard of Jung. Yeah, I don't remember what he did, but I I know of him. He read a lot of the mythology around the world from different cultures and found that archetypes were pretty consistent across them. And he reasoned that each one represents a collective unconsciousness, as sort of a the culture's idea on how a person is meant to grow up healthy. So for, you know, a young man, you start off as the heroic, then the warrior, uh, eventually becoming the king in an ideal story. Princess is synonymous with a child. She is the heir to power. She is in line and she enjoys privilege, but not a lot of responsibility. Why? So if you have, and it's funny, Celestia fits the queen archetype so well, nurturing, motherly. Uh, supportive, guiding. But Hasbro insisted that she be made a princess because that sells better. Oh, yeah, that's true. And the archetype, if a princess is supposed to represent a little girl, then you, for some reason the show is hesitant to show a princess facing true adversity. You don't want to spoil that privileged dream. 
that you're young forever and everyone loves you, but you don't really have to do anything. It's the frustration. Now, people will say, well, what about Princess Twilight? She she did everything the same she did before she was a princess. Get with her friends, magical fire beams. Uh, nothing really that tested her as a ruler. Mm-hmm. And that's my frustration. It's the illusion of growth rather than actual growth. You you beat the bad guy. Here's a castle because you're a pretty princess. See, <laughs> that's why I get mad. So here with this comic, bring it all back. This is Celestia being a ruler. And while it may not seem like adversity, you learn the hidden meaning behind it. And this is what makes her shine. It's, again, what I'd like to see, what I'd like to see in the show. And James, to touch on your point that this is the Celestia Micro, we've seen this in other comics as well. Oh? Yes, in, uh, well, we haven't reviewed this yet, but the Friends Forever with Luna and Pinkie Pie. Mm. Talk about an odd combo there. We learn that Celestia... After Luna's fall, she realized I can't be distant from my subjects anymore. And she cha- She worked to change it. Mm-hmm. And dare I get into the Reflections comic once again where we learn she wasn't infallible. In fact, that being who she is requires a lot of sacrifice. And mm-hmm. the problems that came up when she was unwilling to make that sacrifice. Mm, true that. In my defense, I will say that we are reviewing this chronologically. So I don't want to make any reference to... Uh, comics that will come. I'm trying to judge the comic from uh, what we had at the time. Mm, that was a, that was a first. That was that was a very good step. The Luna and Pinkie Pie, my uh, friends forever, was a, a a very good step as well. And the one with uh, Celestia and Spike, that was also a, oh. a really good step uh, uh, as well. I can't wait so, to go through that one. I can't wait for, to go through that one. It's like it's funny how reticent the show is to develop the character of Celestia, and. While we're on it, also develop the character of Luna, but how the comics are not only very, very happy with it, but they are very lenient. They allow themselves to play a lot with the character. Like, you wouldn't expect Celestia to take a mallet and start smashing melons <laughs> in the show. <laughs> yeah, but you, you don't. Can have that, you can have that work perfect in the comic. Um, uh, I have no idea what they are going for with the characters in the show anymore, mm-hmm. especially because I am I am marathon in season four. Wow! Well. Um, uh, before I watch Equestria Girls Rainbow Rocks, I am marathon in season four because I I feel like it. I want to get back into the right. uh, dynamic of ponies, and it surprises me. Celestia doesn't say a word between episode three and episode twenty five. Of season four. Wow. She spends 22 episodes without saying a word and 24 episodes without even showing up. Mm. Because the last time we see her during all of season four, the mm. last time we see her is in, in episode two and then she shows up again in episode 25. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, have, sure I, have, I have no idea what they are doing with this character, but she appeared in season four. She appeared as many times as she appeared in season three. Well, the problem with the series or the show is that Celestia is a heavy character to deal with, as we can see from this micro here, because she is an immortal per se. I, she lives I, for a thousand years. So she the, the thing that the writers need to deal with Celestia is really deep in this case, um, getting ponies to remember their elders, to respect their elders and whatnot. You know what? I, I disagree with you, with the fact that Celestia is a difficult character to write for. She's as difficult to write for as any other character in this show. The one thing that this show has that is really good, and that is also really... Uh, it, it makes it great, but it also makes it difficult to work with. It has great characters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, at least the main characters, not just the main six, the Spike, the princesses. You have the secondary characters like the Cakes, the Flim Flam Brothers. You have the villains like Trixie, like uh, Discord, all that... Uh, uh, with the exception of a few flat characters, Cadence and Shining Armor. Uh, <laughs> you have characters that are very difficult to write for, but they give you so much that they make your job very easy. It is not difficult to write something for Celestia, or else they wouldn't be able to come up with these fantastic ideas for the comics. Well, it, 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 writing a character is as difficult as you make it. Uh, well, the, it, it so I think... There is a lot of potential to exploit with Celestia right there. The problem is that they don't want to use it yet. When you have the comic and you work for the comic, 
you write the comic so you can sell the comic. Mm-hmm. You make it attractive, you make it good, you make it interesting. However, this is this kills me to say this, but when you write for the show, you have to work in the show a way to sell the toys. Yeah, that's the, the thing. show exists to sell the toys. Uh-huh. And they manage to get fantastic storylines from fantastic characters with the excuse of selling little plastic horses. And they have created some stories that have moved me way more than some of the best episodes of Game of Thrones. Okay? Mm. I'll tell you I'll tell you that much. So maybe that's why they don't want to expand on the character of Celestia so much, because what they might come up with it's not marketable for the for the toy brand. And that's the other thing I need to mention because with the show it's a bit strict from the comics since it's tier one canon. Because whatever goes in the show it sticks to the rest, including the comics. Yeah, so, but whatever happens in the comic doesn't necessarily I happen know. in so the show. That's the, why they can allow themselves to play a lot more with it. I know. So th- that's the thing right now you were mentioning because um, you wish they could do this in the show. But in reality, they really can't. Because what can you write for? I mean, I will be surprised if in Season 5 we get a really good Celestia story. I'll be the first to admit it. I was wrong. But as for now, I can't see them doing the things that we want them to do with Celestia that we want them to mimic in the comics. Sad to say that in the comics, it's just the comics. Well, Norman, I, I have to correct you on one thing. You will be the second person to apologize. I got, I got dibs on that. <laughs> okay, all right. I got dibs. Dibs. So you, you feel the same way? I feel, I feel like... I think James has the right of it that this is meant to sell... T- the show mm-hmm. is ultimately aimed to sell toys. I'm so glad they've managed to make an entertaining, fun show because I think that's actually the best way to sell toys. Oh, true, true. Don't just say, oh, hey, we have a new play set here. No, we have a new world to explore. Um, but, yeah, I, I kind of touched on this when I say that uh, the princess archetype is not meant to be challenged in popular entertainment. Yeah. You're not really meant to see them struggle because that is less appealing for little girls we kind of, well, this is awkward wording, but we we try to seduce kids with the idea of a, of a lifestyle where you never have to really face responsibility. Mm. <laughs> uh, people who, uh, fellow viewers of the Nostalgia Critic, who saw uh, his Princess Diary 2 review. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> they kind of touched on it, that they're, they're talking about, you know, these progressive women who want to stand up for their rights, but then they fall right back into pretty dresses and slumber parties and living this life of intensive privilege. Oh, yeah, that's true. I mean, that happens and it's unavoidable. But if we're talking about princesses, well, we we got some strong princesses in the pop culture world. Princess Zelda, she's badass, right? Who gets kidnapped every game. Who gets kidnapped every time. But she she can change into Sheik. Yeah, right? But yeah, but the That's... minute she changes back, she's locked in a crystal. Uh, I... okay. Sorry, this was a big debate in video games, that the minute you learn Sheik wasn't a boy, boop, kidnap. <laughs> boop, kidnap, and Ganon, Ganon is like, oh, you, I'm sorry. you, you Zel- tricked me. Zelda is a likable character, but she is unfortunately forced into roles of subservience or over-reliance. Mm. Now, Princess Sally of the comic, uh, Sonic comics, oh, God. Oh, that's, gotten, that's gotten weird over the years, but <laughs> she was very popular for being proactive mm-hmm. and not really a damsel in distress. Uh, did you guys know that the Archie comic wanted to kill her off? They've tried that several times. No, yeah. no, no. I mean, the first time when they did it, they killed her off. Sega says, what were you doing? Bring her back. Bring her back. You know, to uh, we are getting close to the Sonic fan on territory. Okay. Moving back to ponies, <laughs> if you the, way that way. I, uh, the way that I uh, to go back to uh, to the MLB. Oh shoot! I just broke my pencil. To uh, uh, go back to uh, pony territory, the way that the show handles the title princess, um, I always saw that as a way to simplify the term of ruler for uh, children watching the show. I know that kids are uh, they are smart, they are clever, they are not they are not stupid. But even they will, t- they will turn their heads over their shoulders when you tell them the word arc bicep. Okay, it's it is it is 
it, even I get a difficulty com- uh, in understanding the terms of uh, the terms of nobility mm. and what's uh, what each one of these figures is. So the way that um, they call each one of these characters princess is a way to simplify it. Mm. Now, according to the uh, the title that they are um, they held, I always saw Celestia as a queen because she's the oldest, she's regal, she's powerful, and she has been ruling the land for over a thousand years. She should be the queen. Luna would very clearly be a princess. And I see the princess as in the next in line, that she is not ruling because Celestia is the one in, in power, but Luna not only is younger, but she doesn't rule the land as much as Celestia does. Mm-hmm. So I will see her as a, prin- as a princess. Cadence, uh, she will be an empress because she is the head of an empire. Now, when you're the head of an empire, you have the title of empress. And Twilight, because she is so powerful, I will actually call her something like Archmage. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, she, she has the, her special ability is magic. She is powerful and very uh, savvy magic-wise. So I will give her the title of Archmage. If this was something more complex as, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or Dungeons and Dragons or something like that, I will give them each one of those titles. Uh Try to present these titles to a child who not only grew up with the idea of, uh, in Disney Disney movies, the evil ones are queens, the good ones are princesses, but who knows, who has no idea what an empress is or what an archmage is. is. Mm. I mean, uh, that's pretty much how I see it. The title of princess used to simplify uh, uh, the the title of ruling over a land or uh, ruling over uh, uh, over a part of the land. Mm, all right, uh, it's a simplification. It's not an insult. All right, all right. I mean, I'd give shining armor the title of pool boy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, oh, no. Shining, Ar- shining armor. He wouldn't be a. He wouldn't even be a pool boy. He will be like a. I don't know. I will. <laughs> No, uh, no, no, James, don't make no. that comment. But, but anywho, the but, gutter. but, but anywho, the gutter. but anywho, if mind. if you're I'm gonna, gonna if you're gonna put it that way, right? I, I would say that in my mind, Celestia would be the Hokage. Oh no, we're going Naruto. Hokage? <laughs> yep. No, Norman, <laughs> you're not going to do that. I will not allow it. That is the final part. Uh, yeah, I'm going to kick him out of his own call. <laughs> Who's, who's read the latest chapter of Naruto? Show of hands. I did. It. It's finished. Chapter 700. I haven't read it because I don't care about Naruto because I hate Naruto. Uh, then but you won't get the joke I just made. <laughs> uh. Believe it. Yeah, really uh. got to hand it to the artist. Mm-hmm. I just, anyway. I, I, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. We're not going to talk about Naruto. Yep. Okay. Final well, thoughts on the Celestia Micro. <laughs> we were reviewing that, guys. Remember? Yeah. We, what? We, what? Celestia's What's role, happening? Celestia's role transfers into a question of <sighs> depicting women in in uh, entertainment. Mm. You know what? Here's finally here's a princess who has a lot of power, and what do we see? We well, here's a weird saying: what you don't see today is what I did. <laughs> Everything that's good in Equestria is likely a result of her efforts mm-hmm. in some way. It's like five degrees of separation. Mm-hmm. And that's the impact she's had on the world. The problem is that's all happening off screen. Oh, yeah. The only time we get to see her is when she's floundering, when she's passing the burden on, sometimes in a very rushed and, in my uh, view, very forced way. And, uh, and that's frustrating because I know there's this great character who has this great potential but we're not allowed to see her for whatever motives, economic or cultural. Mm-hmm. We're just not allowed to see it. And then I guess since I've I've stolen the mic, I'll I'll just give my final thoughts on the comic. All right, go for it, man. Go for it. Just as Norman loves the the moral and the ethics of this comic, I so enjoy the exploration of longevity and its impact on how you live. This is a story about growing up, growing older, and valuing what's come before and what's to come. And so Celestia is perhaps the perfect vessel for this. Luna was out of touch for a thousand years. She's not. She doesn't have this rapport with the land. Cadence and Twilight are brand new to this princess thing, relatively speaking. They 
haven't been around long enough to really have this. This comic celebrates everything that makes Celestia unique and her potential. The only reason it's not my favorite of the micro comics is because the pinky and rarity comics really delved into a characters that are more established both in the show and in the comics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so there just felt like a, an even stronger presentation. But you're right, James, this was the start of a much better portrayal of Celestia for the comics. Oh, yeah. Totally Not just agree. for the comics, but for the, for the, for the uh, franchise in general. That last episode of Season 2 damaged a lot my image of Celestia. And it was the comics, the ones that uh, recovered it. The same way that uh, by the end of Season 2, I didn't really like Fluttershy. And by the end of Season 3, and thanks to the fandom in great, in great measure, I ended up liking Fluttershy to the point that she is my third favorite character in the show. It's, it, it is a combined effort from many different points of view that changed my perception of the character. I will agree with you on that, Silver, is that this is a much better portrayal of Celestia than what we have had in the, in the show itself. Mm, true that, true that. And as for me, I don't know. I mean, like I mentioned it earlier on, to me, this comic is more about respecting your elders and the moral of the story because we didn't really have much of that in the past few issues. Like, to me, the few morals that stand out was the rarity, Pinkie Pie, and now with the Celestia, if I were to grade on morals, this one would be on the top. I I didn't give my final thoughts, right? Or uh, well, give it not yet. Well, it's I okay. I wouldn't call this comic my favorite of the series, both micro, regular, and everything. I wouldn't call it my favorite of the micro series because um, you always hear me say, "Oh, this one has a problem, but it's not a deal breaker for me." Mm-hmm. Oh, this one has an issue, but it doesn't ruin the comic for me. This comic has an issue that pretty much, almost, but not entirely, but almost. Ruins the comic for me. And that's the character of Floribunda. <laughs> that is very <laughs> minor. Floribunda. <laughs> that is very... <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah, she's a minor character, but every time that I look at her, I am like, oh, this flashback to my childhood that I don't want to relieve. Please well, get her out of the way. Technically, and this is like, very no, personal. No, you're not going to change my mind about this. No, 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 no I'm not going to change your mind. It's that I look at this character and I am like, God, Damn it. They could, okay, you made the point. She doesn't like Inkwell. Can we please move on to the next, uh, to, to redeeming her character? Because you, kn- you know they are going to redeem her, and they redeem her in the end, and to me it's very unsatisfying. Oh, yeah, obviously. It doesn't, she, she doesn't ruin Celestia, and she doesn't ruin Inkwell, and that's the focus of it. They didn't mess it up. They didn't screw it up. They did it good. But mm-hmm. Floribunda, it makes the comic lose a lot of points. Also, that ending. But then again... That's more of a personal choice, yeah. choice. So I'm not going to count it. So no, I will count. I will say that uh, in the in the micros, I'm going to say this right now. With only two issues left to review, that is the the Spike micro and the Princess Luna micro. Mm-hmm. There is not one bad micro out there. Uh... The ten micros. No, no, shut up. The ten micros are very good. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm saying it? this right now. I'm saying it right now. The ten micros are very good. All right, but I know what I said about the I know what I said about the Applejack one. Even with that, saying that is my least favorite micro is like saying uh, putting your hope down is my least favorite episode of the show. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean anything, because right. even even as an even as a comic that I didn't like, it still has good stuff in it. So mm-hmm. I cannot I cannot hate it one hundred percent. I cannot give it a one star. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hell, it's, it's difficult for me to give a one star to anything that I watch uh, of, of, on this show. So, yeah. I'm sorry, but can I just point out three very quick things that really didn't tie into the comic big, but they're just sort of fun to worth mention. Okay. First off, in the flashback where Celestia is recruiting Inkwell for the school, mm-hmm. the fillies she brings in are <laughs> the G1, uh, I believe it's called Twinkle Shine, Firefly, and Surprise. <laughs> Yay. Again, which is just a fun little cameo. Celestia's main. The hardest... Celestia, I've drawn her, and I consider her to be the hardest character to draw on the whole dang show. Mm-hmm. Oh, especially God. with that Gradients. especially with that eternally flowing main. I've got uh, like five yeah. different poses for her main alone. Mm-hmm. Rainbow Dash. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, that's something in my throat. Uh, but 
I was impressed by how they how they drew her mane in this uh, in this comic. I really like her mane. <laughs> Just the the yellow outline is a little curious, but it gives that impression of flow of even though it's a static image, you get that impression of movement. Mm-hmm. And third and final, who in their right mind dresses as a clown at a student teacher meeting? Uh, I don't know. There's a clown in the audience, and you know, uh, I know, in I the know. literal sense, um, a phoenix it? right character, maybe. <laughs> Objection. Uh, overruled. Angel Lot Elite is weird. Uh huh. That is true. That is also no, true. No wonder I like fancy pants. Who I'm, con- who I'm convinced is shining armor in disguise. <laughs> oh my! But anywho, James. So that was our final thoughts. Uh, what's next, man? Well. Let's see, because what's next is uh, this is when we are starting to talk about the main series going into single issues. Because next uh, comic that we're going to be reviewing, it will be My Little Pony issue number 23, written by Jeremy Whitley, uh, with art by Amy Meverson, and colors again by Heather Breckel. Mm -hmm. And it's a one-shot issue, something that we haven't had on the main series until now. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, not only that, but it stars the the pets of the main six. That is Angel, Winona, Tank, Owl Issues, Opalescence, um, Opalescence and Gummy. Now, if this is not the best idea for a comic ever, I don't know what will be. Yep. Oh, it's, also be... A miles, it's also a milestone featuring the dumbest line from Twilight ever. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God, please don't get me stuck. My... <laughs> Oh, we're going to start that on the next review, but that yep. will be for another day. And you know what, guys? The next comic after that is going to be the annual. And, oh boy, that's going to be a challenge. Not really. It's just an annual. What is I so know. special? 2013-2014, back-to-back. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Sure. Uh, like I said, going to be a challenge. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, but anywho, anywho. All right, so this is it. This has been for... Uh, today's review and we'll see you guys next week I've been James Cork and I am Norman Sanzo and I'm gonna learn how to go pronounce for a bluggy bluggy you go do that uh, okay Spanish class from now on I will see you guys next time adios have a good one is that how you say bye bye (laughs) is that how you say bye bye in Spanish James Uh, (laughs) that's how you say goodbye in Spanish yes yay this class You have no remedy, dude. You have no remedy. Uh